The Internet is infected and spreading through it right now as one of the most dangerous threats ever, a computer worm called Conficker. This map is showing a visual representation of where all of the known infections of Conficker are across the world. Computer analysts say it's like a sleeper cell, and it may be poised to suck sensitive data out of millions and millions of computers. We all grew up learning that the lion is the king of the jungle. And now that we're not little anymore, we know just how vulnerable they are. In fact, when exposed to man's devices, lions are extremely fragile. The latest weapon being used against them is poison. Yes, poison. And that's one reason why conservationists say Africa's lions are in trouble. Are you suggesting that the lion in Kenya could become extinct? I'm suggesting that the lion in Africa will become extinct. I'm Steve Croft. I'm Leslie Stahl. I'm Bob Simon. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Scott Pelley. Those stories and Andy Rooney tonight on 60 Minutes. The Internet is infected. Malicious computer hackers have been creating more and more weapons that they plant on the Internet. They call their weapons viruses and worms. They're creepy, crawly, toxic software that contaminate our computers without our ever knowing it. You can be infected by simply visiting your favorite website or just by leaving your computer on overnight while you sleep. And the problem is growing exponentially. Last year, the number of infections tripled, and an entire industry of computer security professionals is in a race to keep the hackers from their goal, which is usually to steal your money. One of the most dangerous threats ever, a computer worm known as Conficker, is spreading through the Internet right now. By some estimates, 10 million computers have been infected worldwide. At Symantec, the company that makes Norton antivirus software, engineers have been tracking Conficker since last November as it worms its way across the globe. This map is showing a visual representation of where all of the known infections of Conficker are across the world. This is Conficker. Vice President Steve Trilling says the worm is now living on millions of computers, mainly in corporations. So far, the bad guys who created it haven't triggered Conficker. It's just sitting out there like a sleeper cell. Imagine a network of spies that has infiltrated a country, and every day all of the spies are calling in for their instructions on what to do next. What's the worm being asked to do? That's the interesting thing. The only thing the worm is being asked to do is to ask for further instructions. So we're talking several months. That's right. Several months, it's just been sitting there. That's exactly right. I don't know, I'm hearing Jaws music. It's that ominous, because once the hackers issue instructions, Conficker could turn menacing in an instant. With one click, the worm's creator can instruct it to suck sensitive data, like bank passwords and account numbers, out of millions of computers, or launch a massive spam attack to clog up the works. The newest targets of worms are social networking sites. Trilling showed us how it might work. So is this a real Facebook page? This is a real Facebook page. Oh, okay. And okay. we added your friend and colleague, Morley Safer. You can see down there in the left. He says a worm can crack into a Facebook account, like Morley's, and send a message to anyone on his friends list. We have a message from Morley. A message I'm sure to open since it comes from a trusted friend. Click there. It says, ha, 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 check. Check out this hilarious video of you. That's right. So well, I would do that. I took the bait, and by clicking on the video link, oh, something looks a little off. Very off. Am I already infected just by that? You're already infected. That quickly? That quickly. As Trilling demonstrated on a second screen, the hacker owned me. From here on out, as we'll see, everything you do is going to show up on the hacker's machine. So when I typed my username and password into a bank website, it appeared instantly on the hacker screen, along with my bank account details. Everything I, I type shows up here. Every single keystroke you hit. In fact, if you make a mistake and hit a backspace, that shows up in the window. The hacker then followed me around as I browsed the Internet from CBS News. Take a look at what <gasps> oh the hacker sees. Right? Exactly where you are. 
to Amazon.com. So if I buy something, they're going to have my credit card? Everything you type in, your address, your credit card, it's all going to show up in that window. The Internet has become a minefield. Hackers have hidden their malicious software, known as malware, on some of the most trusted websites, like eBay, the Miami Dolphins football team, even MyBarackObama.com. Trilling says too few people have top-notch, up-to-date security software. There is something that would have prevented me from answering Morley's message, or I would never have gotten Morley's message. As soon as you clicked on that link and you had security software, you would immediately get an alert. This is a bad website, oh. and it would have blocked the attack. You would have never been hit. Putting on that software, you're preventing yourself from becoming a victim. But according to Symantec's own figures, the hackers are inventing 10 to 15,000 new infections every day, designed specifically to get around the latest antivirus protections. Symantec has to send out updates every five minutes. You sell this. I you do. sell the antivirus, antiworm stuff. How do I know you're not just saying go out and get this because you sell it? I mean, you know, there's a sort of conflict of interest here. Well, look, Leslie, in 60 minutes, we are blocking nearly 400,000 threats around the world. If you're going out on the internet and you're not protected, it's like walking out of your house and leaving the door open. But Mary Rappaport says all the doors on her home computer were locked tight. She had antivirus software and a firewall. And so she thought she was safe to do her banking online. But then she noticed something odd going on and called the bank. They told me that three charges in the last three days had been made to my account, one for 3000 one for 4000 and one for 1200 Were you having a heart attack? Well, you know, I had the sense that time was of the essence. The bank replaced the stolen money and suggested that she merely change her password. That was to be the end of it. But the next day, she was checking her balance. And I saw $1,000 being moved from my son's savings account into my checking account. You saw Right it? before my eyes, I saw my money being moved. A hacker was trying to move all her money into one account, her checking account, to make it easier to transfer overseas. Luckily, the bank was able to freeze her accounts before she lost any more money. I had what I thought were adequate protections. You know, I had anti-spyware. You did it. Software did and antivirus. antivirus. And I thought I had a good enough firewall. Wrong. My understanding, anyway, is that they were able to get some sort of a bug onto my system that disabled the ability to update these software the programs. Right. You guys, you want some popcorn? Mary suspects her teenage sons picked up the bug while downloading from music or game websites but it could have come from any number of websites. So tell me what Google is actually doing. Uh, to, to deal with some yes, of these big problems. Yes. Because Google's search engine is what most people use to surf the net, we went to talk to Vint Cerf, one of the founding fathers of the Internet, and now a vice president at Google. The company itself says that one in every 100 Google searches brings up an infected site. People are blaming Google because if you do the search, they say, you know, you, Google should be responsible if we get infected. All right, I think now you've that, heard that. I think I, I have heard that, and I think that's a very bizarre way of looking at things. Google's position is that it's not the policeman of the internet, but its engineers do scour the web and issue warnings about malicious infections or malware. If we happen to see what we believe is malware on that website, then when you go there, we will pop up a web page that says, we think we found malware on this site, maybe you don't want to go there. Now I understand that if you go there anyway, Google gets, send you a second warning. Well, saying, are you, are you serious? We just told you not to go there. <laughs> Something like that. Of course, people still go. And still go. Uh, after, at that point, it's their, their problem. You know, the more you hear about this, the more you feel that if you bank online, shop online, open, some, open a, an email, I mean, that almost anything you do puts you in jeopardy. Actually, that's a true statement, that there are things, bad things can happen. On the other hand, I've been on the net ever since the net started. 
and I haven't had any of the bad problems that you've described. But tens of millions of people have. One in four Americans, according to recent reports, as the hackers get more and more sophisticated. I'm told that you're a hacker hunter. Is that's that a, correct? That's a good way to put it. Don Jackson is director of threat intelligence at SecureWorks in Atlanta, which protects corporations against cyber attacks and tracks the hackers who launch them. Part of my job is to know the enemy, to know our adversaries. So the enemy is a hacker? That's right. An enemy is somebody that wants to use computers to hurt somebody else or to make money for themselves. Using an assumed name, Gozi, Jackson infiltrates chat rooms where hackers sell their worms and viruses to their clients, other hackers. He asks for a demo so his company can create software to disable the malware. The hackers, he says, are typically young, male, and often from Russia. How do you track them down? Well, uh, they're like any other business. They have to advertise to get clients. You're okay. saying that the hackers have ads? Yes. On, on the Internet? On the Internet, publicly available. Um, no. Unfortunately, they're all too easy to find. On websites like this one. He says many Russian hackers are in cyber gangs that display fascist symbols like swastikas and anti-American artwork. And they boast about all the dollars they've stolen from the rich Americans. A single hacker can make $30,000 a month and be championed in local newspapers. There was an example recently uh, where uh, two boys were arrested, actually, and then let go the next day. But the article in the newspaper wasn't that they were arrested and that they had committed a crime, uh, but saying, look at our two local boys made good. They've cheated some greedy Westerners out of so much money. They're heroes. They're, they are. It's not known who's behind the computer worm can figure, whether it's a gang of Russian hackers or some solitary evil genius. This worm is wily. It keeps mutating. Security software companies have been kept very busy. You're locked out, eh? But Conficker can jump over protections. While we were reporting this story in early March, we were stunned to learn that the wily worm had struck us right here at CBS News. People were having problems with their Blackberries, their logons. Louis Pelez, a network engineer, says Conficker is so aggressive, it took technicians here 24-7 over 10 days to hunt down and quarantine the affected computers. Do you actually know where it started? Do you, no. Can you pinpoint it? We really will probably never know exactly how it infected the network. We just know that, you know, once it hit, it began to propagate. CBS News has now contained the infection, but Palez says Conficker could still be hiding undetected somewhere within the network. Did you think CBS is safe? Was that in your head, we're safe, or did you think this could happen? No, I pretty much thought that we were, you know, pretty solid. You try to secure a network, but there's no guarantee that somebody can't come up with something that will, you know, wreak havoc. Configure investigators have been talking about an April Fool's attack because in dissecting the worm, they can see it's been programmed to receive new instructions on April 1st. But nobody knows if the instructions will be benign or something that could disrupt the entire Internet. We all grew up learning that the lion is the king of the jungle. And now that we're not little anymore, we know just how vulnerable they are. In fact, when exposed to man's devices, lions are extremely fragile. The latest weapon being used against them is poison. Yes, poison. African herders, whose livestock and livelihood are threatened by lions, are killing them in the most effective and economical way they can. And overwhelmingly, that's by using a cheap American chemical called Furidan. It's marketed as a pesticide to be used for protecting crops, but it's bought by many to kill animals. And that's one reason why conservationists say Africa's lions are in trouble. We took a journey through the bush in Kenya to find out what's going on. We learned that 20 years ago, there were some 200,000 lions in Africa. Today, there are 30,000, and the numbers are going down all the time. 
Lions are being poisoned at a staggering rate. There's little chance that these cubs will make it to adulthood. Are you suggesting that the lion in Kenya could become extinct? I'm suggesting that the lion in Africa will become extinct. That's the view of Dr. Lawrence Frank of the University of California, Berkeley. He's been following lions for the last 30 years, looking for ways to keep them alive. Elaine Cotterell, his colleague, needs to put a new collar on this lioness named Mara. She's about to dart her and put her to sleep. Well done. He's down and out, huh? Cotterell and Frank have less than an hour to do their work before Mara wakes up. The sleeping lion is a deceptively gentle creature. Her coat, which looks exquisitely smooth, is actually quite rough to the touch. What a magnificent creature. And whiskers, just like in the movies. Seeing those claws sink into soft, padded paws, you understand why she's such an efficient killer. But actually, she may be more afraid of us than we are of her. They're very unlikely to actually attack us. There's been so many years of conflict with people in this area, it's almost hardwired into their system to be terrified of people. With good reason. Over the millennia, people have speared, shot, trapped lions. Today, the primary culprit appears to be poison. Uh, we know of 30 plus poisonings just in this area in the last five or six years. We have data on another 35 or 40 poisonings in our other study area uh, elsewhere in Kenya, but that's got to be just the tiny tip of the iceberg. Let me ask a more immediate question. What happens if Mara wakes up while we're still here? Well, with any luck, she'll go that way and we'll go that way. <laughs> <laughs> Mara is part of a pride which lives on Klaus Mortensen's ranch. Five years ago, he found out just how devastating poison can be when he discovered that another of his prides had gone missing. After a few days, vultures were seen circling on our northern boundary there. We went out and we found first one lion, then another, and then another. Seven in all. The lions had been vomiting and there were no bullet wounds. So you were sure these lions had been poisoned? That we were. Mortensen suspects that furidin was responsible. It's one of the most toxic pesticides sold in Kenya, widely available and hard to detect because it dissipates quickly in poisoned animals. Lab tests, he says, ruled out any other poison. So why would anyone want to poison these glorious creatures? The first thing you need to know is that 70% of the country's wildlife is found outside the protected game reserves on Kenya's vast plains, where wild animals and cattle mingle. Lions are there too, and that's where the trouble begins. The lions attack and eat the cattle. This area is inhabited by the Maasai people, who always had a way of dealing with that. The young men went out hunting lions with spears. It was a rite of passage. Anthony Kasanga was one of them. What does it mean for a Maasai young man to kill a lion? It makes you famous. You feel you get the whole community to know you because you killed a lion. You're Have famous a when you kill a lion. Yeah. If you had one girlfriend, you get 20 more. <laughs> you get 21. You get 20 girlfriends. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of reason yeah. to kill a lion. <laughs> Yeah. It's more than just having 20 girlfriends. Killing lions protects cattle, the very foundation of the Maasai's existence. So when a cow is killed by a lion, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. And Anthony's job now is to avert that disaster and save the lion at the same time. He's a leading member of the Lion Guardians, a group of reformed Maasai warriors who keep track of collared lions and warn herders when the lions get too close to their cattle. Last year, they were too late in reaching an old herder whose cow had been killed. The herder laced the carcass with poison, knowing the lions would return to finish their meal. That night, Sengali and Birdie, two colored lions the guardians knew well, feasted on it. If the carcass was poisoned with furidan, they wouldn't have suspected it because furidan has no taste and no smell. It didn't take long before the lions were found dead. Birdie was pregnant with five cubs. So in other words, seven lions seven died. Seven lions died. 
Cows are a cash crop in Kenya. They put food on the table. They send kids to school. Mengistu Sekeret and his friends all lost cows to lions. That turned them into lion killers. How do you kill the lion? In a very silent way. What is the silent way? Uh, actually, using uh, we, are, we, are, we use the poison. Use poison? Yeah, poison. And this works. This is effective. Yeah, actually, it's very effective. And this is how effective the poison is. This lion could barely walk. Its nervous system was shutting down, so it was put down by vets from the Kenyan Wildlife Service who conducted an autopsy. The official government chemist's analysis found furidan in the lion's stomach. A subsequent report by the agency that regulates pesticides in Kenya did not mention that finding and claimed that furidan was not connected. When we asked Mengistu and his friends about furidan, they didn't recognize the name but knew exactly what it looked like. What do, what do you call it amongst yourselves? Yeah, we call it the blue stuff. The blue stuff. Yeah, that's actually that's their common name. We showed them a bottle of furidan to make sure we were talking about the same thing. Oh, yeah. oh there you go. Oh, wow. It's, it's the one. <laughs> it's the one. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Really, this one. It's bluish, huh? It's yeah, bluish. It's, yeah, it's bluish. And that's the one you use? Yeah. yeah. Mengistu and his friends wouldn't have any trouble finding furidan. It can be bought in towns and villages all over Kenya, in stores called agrovets, which sell agricultural products, including pesticides. But when we tried buying furidan with our camera rolling, the shopkeepers told us they didn't have it in stock. So we decided to go undercover with a hidden camera. Hello. Hello. Do you speak English? Yeah. Good. Do you have furidan? Furidan. Yes, I have. I'll take one bottle, please. There was actually plenty of furidan on the shelves, and we were surprised that the storekeeper didn't ask what we wanted it for. How much is it? One fifty. It's two dollars. That's pretty cheap. Yeah. Did many people buy furidan? So many people buy furidan. So many people buy furidan. Uh, what do they use it for? Uh... <laughs> it seemed clear from stores we visited that shopkeepers knew furidan was not only used on crops. In fact, some stores which stocked furidan were in areas where there wasn't a crop for miles. In its granular form, furidan is banned in Europe and the United Kingdom. It's severely restricted in the United States. Just a tiny amount from a $2 bottle like this one is enough to kill an entire pride of lions. Furidan, even when used as directed, is estimated to have wiped out millions of birds in the United States. That's one of the reasons why the Environmental Protection Agency restricted its use and wants to ban it entirely. But in Africa, furidan is perfectly legal as a pesticide. However, when the granules are sprinkled on carcasses, any animal that feeds on them will die. Not just lions, hyenas, leopards, jackals, vultures and other birds die in droves. It's inexcusable to use furidan for killing animals. It wasn't designed for the purpose. It's grossly irresponsible to use it in that way. Dr. Richard Leakey is the Dwayan of conservationists in Africa who spent years fighting for the preservation of Kenya's wildlife. But you can understand why cattle farmers do use it. I can understand why people rob banks. I mean, there are a lot of things I can understand. It's irresponsible to put on the market something that is so utterly dangerous to wildlife in a country where wildlife is so critical for our economic future. Wildlife is in fact crucial for Kenya's economic future. Hundreds of thousands of tourists bring hundreds of millions of dollars to the country. But most Kenyans see very little of that, so there's little incentive to value the wildlife. The amount of tourism that's here is not sufficient to offset the cost of these people living with wildlife. Tom Hill is an American philanthropist who wanted to make wildlife worth something to the people. He and Richard Bonham, a Kenyan naturalist, recognized that time was running out. It just became very clear, unless we stepped in, and and made some sort of intervention, we were going to lose the land. So they began meeting Maasai to ask what it would take to stop killing lions. The answer, as they gave it to us, is if you would pay us back for our lost livestock once it's been killed by predators, and we can replace it, 
then we would quit killing them. You know, and that's we don't, what you're doing. That's what we're doing. I mean, you know, they don't hate lions. They hate the economics of lions. So Hill and Bonham set up a fund to compensate the Maasai for their livestock losses. Teams of monitors crisscross the countryside to inspect dead cattle and reimburse the owners if they don't poison the lions. The program has achieved some success, but covers only a small area. Throughout the rest of Kenya, the poisoning goes on. How do you stop farmers from doing it? You stop farmers by using unregulated chemicals, by not having the chemical on the market. You ban the product. But the Kenyan government hasn't banned the product. The company that makes it, FMC, declined our request for an interview, but said in a written statement that furidan is important to the sustainability of agriculture in Kenya, that their labels clearly illustrate its proper use, and that they condemn the illegal use of their products to kill predatory wildlife. But does it have to be a choice between cubs and corporations? There are other ways to protect cattle without using lethal chemicals. But for these cubs to grow up to be the splendid creatures they can be, Furidan cannot be part of their future. The maker of Furidan, FMC, told us that in response to reports of poisonings last year, they suspended all exports to Kenya. Last month, we went back to check if it was still on sale. Even without new shipments, we found that in some of the shops it was still on the shelves. FMC continues to export it to neighboring countries where lions are also disappearing. If you've never seen LeBron James play basketball, you've certainly seen him in television commercials or on the cover of national magazines. According to no less an authority than the Harvard Business School, LeBron James is now the third biggest name in the sports world, behind Tiger Woods and soccer star David Beckham, with earnings last year on and off the court of $40 million. It already feels like he's been around for a long time, but he's just turned 24, a prodigy who's lived up to his hype. His team, the Cleveland Cavaliers, lists him as playing the position of small forward, which is a bit of a misnomer, since he's big enough to be an NFL linebacker, only much quicker. He also wants to be the first billion-dollar sports brand. What do people get when they buy into the LeBron James brand? You want to buy in? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, you get, you get me. It's just, it's all real. You know, I'm just... 6'9 and 260, and just so happened to be very good at playing a game of basketball. <laughs> the Quicken Arena in downtown Cleveland is literally the house that LeBron James built, where the Cavalier superstar puts on the hottest show in the NBA. For his opening act, he tosses a handful of chalk in the air, a ritual that's become his personal trademark. This is his other trademark. It's his sixth season as a pro and so far his best. He's continued to elevate his game from passing to shot blocking, from his outside game to defense. Some are now debating whether he will become the best all-around player ever. But when LeBron James is coming at you, don't bother to debate. Just get out of his way. But of all the weapons in LeBron's basketball arsenal, he thinks the most powerful may be his brain. What's the strongest part of your game? the way I approach the game mentally. Um, I, I think team first. It allows me to succeed. It allows my team to succeed. Um, because I'm always thinking about how can I help my teammates become better. I've always approached the game that way ever since I, mean, I was a kid. It's an unusual answer for a big time professional athlete. But then LeBron James is a smart, well-grounded young man who's raising two boys of his own with his longtime girlfriend. Loyalty and togetherness are the threads that have held together his life, most of which has been spent within a 40-mile radius of Cleveland. He was born, raised, and still lives in Akron. It used to be known as the rubber capital of the world before the plants closed and moved away. Today, it's known as the home of LeBron James. How's Akron doing these days? It's maintaining, baby. It's always a struggle growing up in Akron, but we maintain it. 
Did you grow up around here? I grew up on every side of town. <laughs> every part every part of town seen a little bit of LeBron growing up. You moved a lot? Yeah, yeah, a lot. They were not the greatest neighborhoods, and he quickly learned a lot about life and survival, growing up in impoverished circumstances without a father. Did you ever get in trouble? No. Never? Never. Why do you think? Lord knows there were lots of temptations. Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't know. I just, I never walked down that path. I don't know why. I think the man above and my mother just led me in the right direction. Your mother? You give her credit for that? No, oh, absolutely. She got all the credit in the world for helping me become the man who I am today. Yep. His mother, Gloria James, was 16 and unmarried when she had LeBron. And when her mother died at age 42, their situation became dire. We had pressure as far as where the hell we going to sleep at, <laughs> you know, from night, day to day, night to night. How we going to eat from day to day, night to night. When things would get really bad, she would send him off to live with friends, usually one of his basketball coaches, but she was never far away. I didn't reside in a steady home at the time, and um, I wanted him to attend school until I could make, th make our living situation better. That turned out to be a good decision? You tell me. It turned out to be a great decision. So some of those up there are yours? Uh, yeah, three of them. We got. Athletics were always his calling, and school gyms, his sanctuaries. A few months ago, we went back with him to St. Vincent, St. Mary's, and Akron, so he could show his teachers and his high school coach, Drew Joyce, the bling he brought back from the Beijing Olympics. Is that like the real gold medal? Yeah, that's, that's the real one. That's it. A lot of memories, though. A lot of memories in here. Are you any place even remotely close to your peak? Um... I don't want to say I got a long way to go. I don't think I got a long way to go, but it's going to take, it's going to take a little process. Okay. Yeah, we go sit down. Are you going to do anything with this? Who, me? I'm not. Ah! <laughs> you got it? How many times can you do that in a row? <laughs> you know, I'm one take, baby. That's all. I'm just one take. You could just tell he had done that many times here before in a place where he made lasting friends and learned lessons that have endured. When did you first realize that basketball might become a vehicle for changing your life? Probably around the, the, the middle school days, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth. That's one thing Coach Drew, my high school coach, my AAU coach, I'm a father figure to me, always, he always said, he said, use basketball as a vehicle to get to where you want to go. And I didn't know what that meant, you know, but now that I look back on it, I was like, wow. You know, you know, don't, he, we didn't let the game of basketball use us, we used it. James takes the ball up the side. I look at the By the age of 12, he was traveling the country with the best schoolboys from Akron, playing in AAU tournaments against national competition. Touted as one of the best sixth graders in the country, James was already being tracked by professional scouts. When it came time to go to high school, his team decided to go to St. Vincent St. Mary's together. So you brought your whole AAU team. Most part, yep. For the most part. And your coach. Yep. Here. Yep. Package deal. Yep, package deal. <laughs> yep. And you ended up with the national championship. Yep, I ended up with a national championship. Are you serious? By his senior year, ESPN was following his high school games and showing his highlights on Sports Center. Before he graduated, LeBron's picture had already graced the cover of Sports Illustrated above the caption, The Chosen One. LeBron wasn't particularly impressed since he didn't know at the time what Sports Illustrated was. I just thought it was just another sports magazine. They wanted a, a sports figure, a guy that could play basketball on the cover. I didn't know how big Sports Illustrated was. <laughs> you know what 60 Minutes is? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's an hour, right? <laughs> an hour. <laughs> Just a few months after being selected the most likely to succeed in his high school class, he signed a multi-million dollar NBA contract with the last place Cavaliers. And a seven-year, $90 million endorsement deal with Nike, the most ever paid to a basketball player. Trust, come back. 
Another lucrative contract with Coca-Cola laid the foundation for what LeBron hopes will become a billion-dollar business empire. And it didn't take the enterprise long to begin paying dividends. Three years after joining the lowly Cavaliers, he led them to the finals of the NBA championship with one of the greatest clutch performances in history. He single-handedly scored his team's last 25 points in a double overtime victory against Detroit. The game was so magical. I mean, I, I still watch it to this day. You didn't feel nervous taking those shots? No. You can't be afraid to fail. It's the only way you succeed. You're not going to succeed all the time, and I know that. You have to be able to accept failure to get better. Here I come, cannonball! Three years ago, LeBron took one of his biggest risks ever. Hold that thought, I'm going to call you back. Deciding he wanted to control his own image, not just appear in other people's commercials. He stunned the sports world by firing his agent and starting his own company to handle his outside business interests with some of his childhood buddies from Akron. So I got to ask you, why did you decide to fire your agent and hire, hire these guys? You know, I just felt like in order for, for me to grow, um, as, a, as the, the person that I wanted to become, as the leader, as the businessman, I had to, um, you know, make a change, uh, make something that I think could benefit myself and benefit the guys that was around me. Two of his partners, Richard Paul and Randy Mims, had no business background at all, and the then 23-year-old CEO, Maverick Carter, had only a marketing course and an internship at Nike to draw on. A lot of people, including the commissioner of the NBA, worried that it might be a recipe for disaster. Everyone said, what is he doing? Why would he give three of his friends, three young African-American guys, that's what they really wanted to say, right? Hand over his business to them at that level. Yo, cool down some, okay? But that's not the way LeBron saw it. LeBron looked at it as, I know these guys, I believe in these guys, I trust these guys. I'm going to give these guys the shot. I'm going to empower them to do all the things they want to do and all the things they've seen and dreamed about doing. They've been smart enough to surround themselves with some very good talent, hiring top account managers and lawyers, PR people and publicists. It's won them credibility and respect in the sports business world. you got a lot of money. You stay healthy, you're going to make a lot more money. You could just lay back and play basketball. Why is it so important for you to become successful in another area? Um, because I have that gift. Um, you know, God gave me a gift to, to do other things besides play the game of basketball. Ladies and gentlemen, LeBron James! He showed some flair for comedy hosting Saturday Night Live. And his dance routine at the ESPY Awards two years ago made all the highlight reels. Now you are just as likely to find him on the cover of Vogue or Fortune wearing a custom-made suit than on the cover of one of those sports magazines. But ultimately his goals will be achieved or denied on the hardwood floors of the NBA, and he is having his best season yet. This season he is second in the league in scoring, has had a number of 50-point games, and given the Cavaliers a chance to enter the playoffs with the best record in the NBA. What's next? Hopefully NBA championship. Important to you? Very. Um, it's one of the ultimate goals for me as a basketball player. How close do you think the team is? Uh, we're very close. LeBron got that dream watching his idol Michael Jordan while he was knocking around this rec center gym. Jordan played until he was 40 and won six championships. LeBron is just starting out. His favorite sound is still the swish the ball makes slicing through the net. You hear that net? And he's only 24. Tonight, Andy answers some mail. It's always fun to read the letters people send. I get a lot of them, although, to be honest, if I took all the letters seriously, I wouldn't ever say anything again. I get quite a few bad letters, and of course I pay least attention to those. I don't want you to see me cry. Thomas Overly writes from Oceanside, California. He's mad because he thinks I like President Obama. Very sorry to see someone I respected contribute to this mass media love affair, Tom says. 
Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Overly, I do like Obama, but I didn't think you'd notice. Todd, from Las Cruces, New Mexico, says the reason I don't hear about the people who hate Barack Obama is because the press has put a muzzle on them. I don't know about that, Todd. I show the producer my piece before it goes on the air every week, and he'll tell me it isn't any good, but he never puts a muzzle on me. I said there were no organs left in movie theaters, and apparently I was wrong about that. A lot of people wrote to invite me to their movie house that still has an organ. Larry Saraga of Sayville, New York, thinks I'm set in my ways. Andy, Larry writes, you need to get out more. <laughs> Gee, I don't know, Larry. Don't forget, being set in my ways is what I do for a living. At least a dozen people wrote to say I made a mistake, saying that Snuffy Smith won the Congressional Medal of Honor. They all said the real name of what he got was the Medal of Honor. Several people also objected to my saying that people won the Medal of Honor. They're quibbling, but of course they're right. It would be better if I had said, were awarded the Medal of Honor. Well, you've got to be careful saying anything on television. Michael Callums of LaPorte, Indiana writes, What's the story behind your desk, and can I have it when you're done? Well, the story is, Mr. Callums, I made the desk myself with a great piece of walnut from a tree that came down in the woods near our house. The rest of the story is, no, you can't have it when I'm done, and don't try to hurry me out of here either, Callums. I'm Scott Pelley. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes.